morning. This is Chippa Khan, and welcome to The Otherworldly. Otherworldly is the weekly Zoom show for uh, Changing Times, Changing Worlds conference, uh, where we uh, try and uh, make the, the uh, paranormal, supernatural, whatever, imp uh, to be practical. And we're not so much worried about proving that this stuff exists. <clears throat> We know it exists. We want to know how to use it to make our lives better, which is why I'm very, very psyched because tonight we've got Corby uh, uh, Mitley. Uh, Mitlied. Mitlied. I keep forgetting the pronunciation, which is why you put it up there, Mitlied, um, as our guest because that's what she does. She's not out there proving uh, that we have past lives. She's, she's out there helping people take take a peek. I think you take a peek and then tell them um, what happened in, in previous lives and how it's uh, bleeding into creating opportunities uh, uh, for, for the modern visit life. But, you know, we will, I hope, talk a lot about, um, about the past lives. It's, it seems to be a, a good conversation to me. Uh, because it, my personal perspective is it is the ultimate uh, recycling. Matter and, and spirit cannot be created or destroyed. It just keep doing different things with it. So we are, uh, if you uh, want to uh, join, if you want to join the conversation, uh, there's in reactions, you put up your hand and, and we, we're trying very hard not to talk over each other. So Corby is, well, if you want to find out more about what Corby does, um, there's a series of books uh, that called, by Robert Schwartz, uh, which feature her as a, as a channel and talk about how she works with uh, pre-birth Pre-birth planning, which I, I have That's to know more about. It's your soul's plan, your soul's gift, your soul's love, which I haven't got yet. Um, mm -hmm. And and occasionally she she has her own. She's on shows. I think she has a show. She does. She has several books of her own. Um, I I like clean out your life closet. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, but the yellow brick road. Um, is is another favorite. Um, we've known each other longer than we ought to uh, uh, ought to want to admit. I have some very strange pictures of us as fantasy babe garb from a picnic. No, they're they're buried somewhere and they're only in a physical copy, so they will probably never reach the internet. But we were cute back then. <laughs> uh, Patry was cuter. Uh, so. Um, Yes, yeah, so let's since that's the one that I wanted to, to get to before um, before we get to some of the other stuff. Pre-birth planning. That sounds mm -hmm. a lot more organized than I've ever been. Okay. First of all, um Chippecon, Yeah. 49 years. Is it? It's been 49 years. Yes. Well, that's close to 50. Yeah, it is. Half a century. <laughs> I know. I, I just make it simple and say since no Moses wonder was in we're diaper. so cool. Look at all the practice we've got. Anyway. Yes. So what is pre-birth planning? Yeah. Through Robert's books, the idea about pre-birth planning is dovetailed with karma. And through what we've learned doing those books. Karma is not just carrot and stick. That's the kindergarten way of thinking about it. Karma is, on a major level, five things. Healing, service, contrast, unbalanced energy, and healing of beliefs. Now, let's say that the soul, the higher self, wants to learn a certain thing. It sits down with its counsel and... Basically, it's almost like a computer flowchart. In my case, for instance, with the things that I wanted to learn in my life, I knew it was going to be a very rough road 
full of difficulties, challenges. And so my soul decided it would need a best friend in one of the parent positions. The soul, the higher self of my father, Jerome Dorkin, in most lifetimes is same generation with me and a best friend. So one soul said, I would appreciate it if you would come in as a parent unit. See that? So there's where the planning is. And checking, it sounds like there's a cat stuck in the closet, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that case, we changed the monad as it's called. In this life, I was born on my father's birthday. We always understood each other in ways that the rest of the family didn't. And he was the one who believed in me and when everybody else in the family was medical, including him, and I was the actress, the writer, the rebel, he was the only one who knew at core I was walking my right path, no matter how crazy it looked. So that is an example of how a soul can make relationships, choose happenings to plant along the life road before it gets down here. Now, people will very often say, well, what does that do with free will? And you can have both. When you go to college, you decide to be a physics major, but you can graduate having done nothing but gut courses or double major plus lab. The tougher your life, the dumber you are not listening to what you should be doing, that's double major plus lab and that's where I went. There was an incident that happened when I was 16 with my alcoholic mother. My reaction of that, if I had reacted one way, it would have given me a much easier life. My reaction made my life extremely difficult, but I will graduate having learned what I need to learn women are worth more than their bodies. I am worth more than a bargaining chip and a couple of other things, even though I took the tougher road. Um, bluntly, I have been through three bouts of breast cancer, two divorces, rape, poverty, abuse. If I had taken that other road, it might've been very easy. I might've been married once and stayed married. But I believed what she told me, which was the trip trigger. And I spent at least 30 years figuring that my mother's condemnation of me was right. And I had to go live that. Once I stopped that at the end of the third cancer dance is when life started to change. My gifts got stronger. My abilities got clearer. And I began to teach and do my work the way I was meant to. That's part of the examined life. What's the examined life? This stuff's happening to me and I can't stand it, but I'm gonna have to go through it. First, what do I need to learn from it? For me personally, second is how can I teach with it? And then last thing is next. You don't stay stuck in your story. You've got to move on. Does that give you a, a little idea about what pre-birth planning is about, Chip? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, it does. Of course, I, I, a lot of my early um, reading back in the 60s was uh, the Seth material. And yes. Jane working Robertson. with your higher soul and, and working with other souls to plan what you're up to. Totally made sense with me. Uh, I was. <clears throat> uh, oh, Griffin, did you have a question? Go ahead, unmute. Unmute, please. Yeah, that probably works better. Um, Corby, I believe you said you were born on your father's birthday. Yes. So was I. And I grew up to be his identical twin. And that's always been one of the least discussed, but most 
profound part of my life because he had a hard life. He spent most of World War II in a German prison camp. But he always, I didn't realize that he was basically very supportive of me. And I do remember when I applied as a conscientious objector to avoid going to Vietnam, um, he said, I was talking to him about it, he said, yeah, you should do that. That war is even more screwed up than the one I was in. <laughs> and yeah, well, he apparently he was very bitter. I don't blame him. Um, our first campaign in North Africa, which is the first time we really engaged the Germans, was led by an incompetent general. And we got, we got, we got our butts kicked. And that's how he ended up in the prison camp. And he said, badly trained, badly equipped, and badly led. So, but yeah, he, I don't know whether he just shaped me and my thinking so much, because he and my mother were both free thinkers. I mean, what else can you say from a lapsed Catholic, a lapsed Baptist who got married in a Methodist church? So. But I'm curious, how many other people were born on a parent's birthday? Because, you know, you get 30 people together, they, two of them will share a birthday. Um, now, I'm not sure how much the, the birthdays. It's a lovely coincidence. It might have some impact on the astrology, but it might be simply a wake up call. It also might be just, if you will, um, a way to bond them. It doesn't have a massive esoteric meaning, but mm -hmm. you know. Well, I, I was just curious I, about it because I, I think about him now and again, mm -hmm. and it is interesting that born on his birthday and his first child. Mm -hmm. So, these were things oh. that you planned for pre-birth. Yeah. Um, now. For instance, in my family, there was my brother, two miscarriages, and me. The work that I've done, uh, I strongly believe that my wonderful nephew, um, who is a scientific genius in Boston, was supposed to be an older sister, was one of the miscarriages. But we very strongly said we have to be in each other's lives. So he came back through my brother. He also happens to be the only member of my family at this point who doesn't think I'm a charlatan who steals people's money. Oh, there we go. Okay, that, may I? Okay, I'm going to throw a question out there that you might have a perspective on. Okay. Uh, I had I had a stillbirth, and then followed by my son being born, and I always yes. figured, okay, it was an accident. Accidents happen. And that was, it just took him 18 months to, to get gestated. I figure he's the same kid that just came back and gave it another shot. Yes. Yes. Very, very often it happens that with miscarriages, the kid, the soul says, there is something about that body that will not serve me in what I want to do. So the physical envelope is jettisoned, and if you will, the kid gets back and goes down the slide a second time. Yeah. But so, so we're we're together, and I think we were meant to be together. And I, I was cranky as, as one gets. After all, one is one's hormones are doing strange things during mm -hmm. pregnancy. But um, it never never occurred to me that you just boss. muted yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I know I tripped. I was going over to say, why am why why am we looking at you instead of me when I'm talking? <laughs> uh, it's a um, you know it just it was it, I I don't have the same attitude toward death that a lot of people do. It's just it's it's a thing we pass back and forth to and from. Okay, the show of hands, guys. How many people here um, do believe in in uh, the, accept the concept of reincarnation? 
Yeah. Okay. So we're not. <laughs> so so we we're at least the people who've shown up here tonight uh, are are working from that as a as a position. Um, I any, do. Somebody however, else. Yeah. Yes, Corey. Go. Um, I cannot tell you how many times that Bible thumpers will say to me, but the Bible says we only live once. And I look at them and go, and you're absolutely right. Because it is the soul that reincarnates every time. The faces we see here, you are one and done. In this form, with this recipe, you will never be down here again. The way I explain it, to people who don't understand souls is I say, okay, let's take the actor, Matt Smith. Matt was the 11th doctor, he's my doctor. But as soon <laughs> as he was done with the doctor, he hung up the bow tie and the two short pants and he became Prince Philip for the first two seasons of The Crown. And when he hung up the nautical suit, he went and became this whack job in House of the Dragon. Now, Matt Smith is like our higher selves. The doctor, the prince, and the whack job are all incarnations. They are all made, uh, they're all brought to life by that soul, but they are completely and distinct, distinct. And once that part is done, that soul, that outfit gets hung up in the closet and doesn't get worn again. Does that mean we snuff out like a candle? No, it does not. What happens is the closer we are to compassion, non-judgment, peace, clarity, that's our soul coming through. Perfect example. You've heard me talk about my father. He was a brilliant, magnificent cardiologist and family doctor. Sometimes when I do medical work, especially if it's cardiac related, he will come in. What does he bring with him? Well, yes. He still puns terribly. His compassion, his insightful medical knowledge. What is no longer around? His depression, his anxiety, and his hypochondria. Those were things that were needed on earth to propel him to learning situations. He doesn't need them upstairs. When I work with him, he puts on the Jerry Dorkin suit because it's nice to see dad. And he brings down all of the good things that my father learned. But it is not quite the same as Jerry Dorkin. Do you see that difference? Yes, no, maybe. That's, I see the difference. I, I like it. Uh, I, I often say that it's like uh, when your car, you, you have a car you really like, but sometimes it doesn't work. So you have to get a new car. It's a vehicle, but you're never going to be able to, you're not going to have that anymore. And uh, so, but so, so we make them, it, make it last as long as you can. Yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, is, but um, yeah, I am. Um, does anybody else have any very deep questions that they, they wanted to ask Corby or any other questions or any points that they want to bring up about by yourselves, uh, reincarnation? All right, let me tell you what I do when I do it, which may help a little bit. I am what I call a past life retrieval expert. Now, what's the difference? Past life regression is what most people have heard of. That's where the subject gets hypnotized, they go wandering around to the Akashic and they see their lives. Now, that must only be done by a certified hypnotherapist and past life regressionist because if you go up there and you observe your death or a very traumatic situation, they can pull you out just enough so that you can observe, but you don't relive it, which could cause serious trauma. What I do is past life retrieval. In other words, you give me an obsession, a phobia, a place, a person, a life challenge, and I'm the one who goes up into the Akashic, pulls down the appropriate lives and basically says, read chapter two. Um, the advanced uh, examples that I will often use, and Catherine, you may have already heard these. Um, there was a woman who came to me 
when I was doing an expo, she said, look, my son is 29 and he won't make any decisions without me first. He won't live more than a mile away. What the hell is going on? Quick trance, went upstairs, said, okay, 1944, Utah Beach. So this is D-Day. I'm seeing your son. He's on the beach. He's taken a fair amount of shrapnel in the leg. You're his commanding officer. You scramble over a dune. You pull him to safety. You take some shrapnel too, but you both live. And I opened my eyes and she's just looking at me pale. She said, can you tell me what my rank was? I said, yeah, you were a sergeant. She goes, he's called me Sarge since he was three years old and we've never known why. That is when knowing a past life is valuable. Do not come to me and say, I must have been Anne Boleyn because I can't wear turtlenecks because you will be at the door. <laughs> Why do we not remember all of our past lives? Because we don't need to. If you're a janitor in Des Moines and all of a sudden you discover that you were Napoleon Bonaparte, you're going to be happy with a mop? No. Past lives are remembered only when they can make a difference for us. That is the only time that they are valuable. Otherwise they just get in the way of our living our best life now in the personality that we have at this point. Yeah. I, I often have said that if you were Napoleon and you remembered, you'd spend your entire time playing little miniatures, trying to figure out how you could have won. It's like, no, that's that's not useful. Have, have I ever told you my theory about uh, the soul as um, like an amoeba? No. The, so, the soul grows and it grows. And when it is full of experiences, sometimes it says, well, I've, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And it buds and becomes two souls. And each of those souls go out and they all contain all the information from the past lives they've had. And as they continue growing, they keep, but so perhaps many, many people in their past lives were an Egyptian priestess. Now, the chances are very good they weren't all Cleopatra because she was freaking Greek and they don't remember that because they didn't study in history. But, but they remember just enough to remember, gee, I seem to remember being somebody of rank in Egypt. And we may have dozens of us, all of whom have this one past, the you know, root being in common. But it's not you don't have to worry about it. That's that's my theory, and uh, I'm satisfied with it so far. <laughs> Shepherd Shepherd Hoodwin, who channels um, the Michael entities, not the archangel, but the causal entity, uh, says that sometimes souls do come down in more than one body, or you can have two souls in one body. I have not experienced that. I haven't run into that, but most of the Michael channeling is pretty accurate. So that might be the kind of thing that you are talking about, you know, because no, not everybody can be the Red Baron. Not everybody can be George Washington and not everybody can be Mata Hari. It just, it ain't happening. So, yeah. and you know, the most important lives you have are the ordinary ones. I have only gotten, I think, three famous people, past lives for folks, and they weren't wildly, wildly famous. One of them was Mercy Otis Warren, who was best friends with Abigail Adams and one of the most literate women of the American Revolution. One of them was Nellie Bly, who was um, a investigative journalist in the early 20th century. And the woman that I channeled that for, I have never seen her picture, but you take a look at her and she's a dead ringer for, for Nellie Bly. And the third one was a woman who was really brilliant with black and white photography in Canada and didn't know why she wanted to quit her job and do that. And we discovered that she was Jacob Reese. Now, who was Jacob Reese? R-I-I-S. If you go and look at the heart-stopping, arresting pictures of the slums, the very beginning of the 20th century, that was Jacob Reese. And the kind of work she did and the kind of composition she did was very much like that. And she had never heard of him, but when she looked at the pictures, she literally had trouble breathing. And she is now a black and white professional photographer in Toronto. That's when past lives are important.
I see Griffin wants to ask another question. Mm -hmm. Unmute, please. Yep, sorry. I want to share an experience I had that affirms the notion that past lives, certainly in my case, told me something about myself that otherwise seemed pretty random, but I couldn't otherwise explain. And I, I went to a reader, and this was nominally a palm reading, but I have since learned that people don't just read your palm, they're reading the whole you in every way possible. And he specifically had mentioned clear images of two past lives. One was a minister in a coastal town somewhere in New England. Farther up north might have been Maine. And I always had, for the longest time, I had a drive to almost actually went to seminary and became a Lutheran minister. The other one was interesting, which explained two aspects of my life. One, and what that was, I was a soldier, possibly an officer in Napoleon's army of all things. And the way I died was I was thrown from my horse and as I was trying to get up, somebody on horseback pointed his gun down and shot me right here. This shaped my attitude towards war and it explains a chronic bad shoulder. It actually manifests in physical form because the trauma must have been amazing. And uh, so the I think the ministerial thing is where I get my sense of compassion and wanting to nurture people and care for them. Mm -hmm. And that, that role has always been very attractive. And then this business of uh, you know, dying in the field. Um, like I say, both the mental attitude towards war and a, a, a physical problem that has plagued me for decades mm. doesn't seem to have an answer, except getting a 50 caliber mini ball fired out of a musket at you and dying that way. So it was just two tidbits to say, yeah, I've been there too. Very often we will bring forward uh, pains that we cannot understand or explain from past lives, but occasionally, if we are regressed and we do relive that, we can relieve them. For many years, I had odd pains down the front of my chest, didn't know why, did a regression where I relived being shot down, World War I, that's where the bullets hit. After that regression, gone. So now if I can sort of maybe kind of put somebody a little bit on the spot. Catherine has done, yes, you're gonna, I'm gonna make you unmute. I have done a soul plan reading for Catherine. Mm -hmm. What a soul plan reading is, is a life challenge is presented. And I'm the one who goes upstairs, deep trance meditation, pulls down several past lives that kind of macrame together the answer to what the situation is in terms of the life challenge that you bring me. Catherine, when I did that for you, how did that change things? Oh, tremendously. I, in this life, I think the theme for my soul session was the dynamic I had with my mother and my sister. And it brought an awareness to the, the toxicity of that and how much energy I was feeding into it and actually catapulted me to the healing. I still struggle with it, but um, not as vastly as I did prior to the reading, if that makes sense. Um, but it gave me this understanding. I think, which one were you highlighting, Corby? Because apparently I like to jump lives. <laughs> um, so, um, so I had a lot of questions because I'm very, that soul session, time isn't linear. So it, I guess I was you know, overlapping a little bit. What, was it the antebellum one was the most prolific life? And it's interesting because the role I had in the antebellum period resonated so much with my day job right now, being in healthcare, working with healthcare law. I was a lawyer back then. And also coincided with my husband, who I guess we've been 
mates together, <laughs> our best friends and other lives. Um, but it, it has helped me a lot. I did have a question though, something yeah. I might've asked you, Corby, I don't know. Um, yeah. For past lives, can themes randomly bubble up? Because recently, well, within the last year, I've had this, I've never had it before, intense interest into becoming a pilot. And I think I've I shared it. In, and I, I work in healthcare. I'm, I'm a Reiki practitioner too. So <laughs> I, I, I've jumped out of planes, but I haven't ever dreamed of being a pilot. And I think I just had shared off the cusp. Is there a reason or something I should be focusing on? If that happens, does it necessarily indicate it's a past life thing? Oh, or is it just a figment of my imagination? <laughs> Did it just kind of go boom out of yes. the blue? Okay. Like last That's year, okay. I was like, why do I want to be a pilot? What is this world? Like, I have enough there on my. Is, there's going to be some connection with a past life. You may not want to be the pilot, but remember, I knew nothing about World War I, terrified of, of Germans until I went to Rhinebeck in 91. And overnight, I needed to speak German. I needed to learn about World War I. I recognized the pilots because I was trip triggered into finding that life that was so important for me to correct things in this life. He was anti-Semitic. I was born into a Jewish family, things like that. So very probably this is something that's going to bring another past life around. And remember, we do double drops. There was one client I worked with who said he kept flashing back and forth, seeing pickets charge first from the uh, Confederate side, then from the Union side. And it wasn't things he saw in books because everybody was moving. He had double dropped down on both sides. I know in this life, there is or was a, a sheep farmer in New Zealand with five boys and a mild alcohol problem. That is, again, part of my soul dropping down, learning a different lesson. My mother was an alcoholic. This person's mother was. That other part of the soul was the alcoholic. So there must be something about addiction that the soul wants to learn. But You'll never meet the other half of your soul because that's, you know, kind of like if you go with Harry Potter and Voldemort and Harry's wand meeting and they both have the same Phoenix feather in it. It just doesn't work. But yes, if you're getting a kick for a pilot, it doesn't necessarily mean that you were a pilot. But if you look at what kind of a pilot you want to be and maybe start looking at planes and seeing if one goes ping that may give you a key into what past life is bubbling up, whether you were a pilot, whether you married to the pilot, whether you were a mechanic, whether you, was the, you were general that sent them out, there's something there for you. Doesn't mean you have to be a pilot this time. I think we mentioned it was World War II wasps and I don't know nothing about World War II, but- um... Time to go looking. I knew nothing about World War I. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna go dig it up. I'll go ask Anthony, <laughs> my husband. He loves World Good. War II. So, Good. So. He can help. Yay, husband. Anybody else got stuff? We're well, losing one or two people, so I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to uh, uh, oh, chat well, if they want to. And one, one dropped out because she had a migraine. So. Oh, Ooh, that'll do so it. Oh, dear. I had uh, suddenly made a left turn while we were listening to you. Um, when a married a member of a married couple, and in this case, I'm talking about myself, realizes that they are bound to the other one in such a deep way that the universe went out of its way to bring them together. And I would speak now of Feather Stitch, who is my wife, and we met on the computer before there was a World Wide Web and got together 
through the most impossible set of so-called coincidences and unlikely events. Now, we celebrated our 30th anniversary this month. And last month. Last month, February 20th, <laughs> week after Valentine's Day. And I was wondering if you have advice for someone who wants to explore this relationship further to get better educated, how to look for signs. About what we are to each other and we are to each other what what i am to her yeah because i know that we are so tight now you know we we joke in fact it, well, when we were going to do we were doing merchanting in the sca and she was selling things we actually came up with a slogan guillaume et jean vieve non vendite solus guillaume and jean vieve not sold separately and that's just the way we are. And I remember that a couple of years into our marriage, we were attending some, I think it was featuring businesses locally or something like that in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And somebody looked at, at, who was a massage therapist, looked at us and said, are you twin souls? Well, I missed that one. Of course, I do. Oh, you know were there. You remember it. I know there was there. there and there was somebody <laughs> from Fulton, I think who looked at me and said, oh, you're William. I said, well, oh, yeah. But well, how'd you know well, my name? Well, that was different. Yeah. yeah. She said, oh, no, I mean, William the Wizard. Obviously, this was a soul that she knew very well. I had no clue. Mm -hmm. but that was Mary Hudson, yeah. Mary Hudson, there you go. Um, so He's the one that first... gave you the laser quartz point. Ooh, right. The plasma cutting torch of the celestial world. Um, anyway. But I was curious then, because it was only fairly recently that I got involved into this kind of work at all. And I did it because I was following her around. And I started showing up on Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that I had a, a pretty fair amount to give and receive. Uh, so it's expanded that part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry I didn't get there sooner, but then I, people look, I, I say I've been married um, for 30 years. You said you're what? You're 72? I, yeah, I, it took me 43 years to find the right girl. So. Mm -hmm. So I think what I'm wondering, and possibly what you're wondering, is Could something like this help us understand better what we have been to each other and how we could work better together in this life? It might. There are several ways you could do it. Um, Robert Schwartz, I know, is um, he was an MBA who started writing this book and now he's a hypnotherapist, so there you go. Mm -hmm. um, but he does between lives stuff. So you want to look up Robert Schwartz. Um, find someone who can help you do past life regression for yourself. Uh, the work that mm -hmm. I do that Catherine is talking about, soul plane readings, um, if it's just we're curious about, don't do it. Why? I'll be really mm -hmm. honest. It's too damned expensive. Mm -hmm. Because okay. <laughs> I spend 12 hours in deep trance meditation, getting mm -hmm. the past lives down and checking your numerology and talking to your higher self. And then I spend an hour on the phone with y'all. And frankly, that's 600 bucks. It's a lot cheaper. It. It's like 20% per hour of what I normally charge because I want mm -hmm. people to be able to afford it. My dear friend, Stacy Wells, who actually sees the pre-birth planning session, she can get away with charging two grand and she's got a three-year waiting list. That's not my style. I want to make it possible for everybody. But I always tell people I'm not special. You can find a way to do this yourself. Robert Schwartz, I think, is probably your best way to do it. Because I know he does group sessions where everybody, you know, it's between lives and he brings you and you talk to your counsel and all of that stuff. That, those are things I don't do. But that might be your best way to do it. The other Thank thing you. is... And I really, really mean it. Do not spend a lot of money. Don't spend more money than you have to. 
Ask yourself, is this going to make a massive difference in our lives? Or are we just curious? Well, because, it's at least partly that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, simply because there are a lot of charlatans out there who are going to spend or get you to spend buckets of money. That's part of what my book, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, How to Find the Real Wizards and Avoid the Flying Monkeys is about. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's fair that we charge. You're, mm -hmm. We're doing a service. I've been doing this stuff for 50 years. I'm not 10 bucks in Jackson Square, New Orleans. But I keep telling people you can do it. I am not, you know, or, or as I say, my it's not that my aura don't stink. So yes, it will work for you. Find mm -hmm. the least expensive way to do it. Mm -hmm. Match your notes, but do not let it divert you from what you're discovering in this life. It sounds okay. like you're doing a pretty fine job already. We may just leave it be then. Yeah, honestly. Well, uh... Well, I would probably pursue it. And what you gave us for an answer is exactly what is looking at pointers, a sense of direction, mm -hmm. and also a sense of how important it is to do or not do. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, really? I always, um, no, sorry to hear that. Um, I just constantly am looking to try to make. I guess the whole universe better, starting with me. And I've been doing that kind of work frequently with no guidance for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And so spending too much money isn't really a big problem for us because we haven't got money to spend too much of. Mm -hmm. we, we live on social security and there's your brick wall. So, but. Mm -hmm. We all, you know, uh, it's probably something that, based on the way I feel right now, mm -hmm. I can't let go of because I feel like there's some kind of answer there, okay, and it's well, more we'll than just that. idle curiosity. But thanks for the help on that. Yes. You're welcome. I just put the URL for Rob's sessions up in the chat for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That's cool. But um. Would you, I, I'm thinking uh, people tend to, and I think it may be the stories of the Dalai Lama being reborn mm -hmm. at the time he his previous incarnation died. I kind mm -hmm. of think that might be a, here, we'll give you this as a gimme so that you can find him again. But I I don't see linear, I don't see reincarnation as linear. I see... We have the vast panorama of every place and we can put our soul wherever it's useful. Uh, yes. I, I believe in, in not reincarnation, but multiple, sometimes simultaneous and certainly not linear in, incarnations. Time is a web, not a line. But because we have line brains, I can say I was a World War I pilot who was shot down over Zonnebeck Ridge in Belgium in 1917, reborn as an Italian-American in Chicago in 1918, died in 1949, came back as me in 1955. Now, oh, maybe, <laughs> well, I'm showing that because that's how I understand it. Who knows if it was actually in this order? You know, the way I explain it to people is look, you know, we're never going to know everything. Our brains are so tiny in comparison to the vastness of the information we need. We are like bringing an ant into a calculus class. Not only can its brain not comprehend what's on the board, it can't hold a pencil in its whittle paw. Don't waste your time. That's where we are. We do our best. We're not going to know until we you know, cross over. But we're trying to make sense of things. At the same time, remember that we are nothing but fractious, bloody dust motes on a dust mote of a planet flung out at the end of the Milky Way in a middling galaxy. And how important are we really not? 
we will learn for ourselves and there might be upper helpers, but no, this is not God said, you will do this. No, it, it's, I would love that we're that important, but we're not. I mean, think about men in black and the little guys in the locker. All hell, Jay. Maybe that's what we are. We don't know. We do the best we can with what we've got. There are ways we learn through incarnations after incarnations, but it could be that we live in a locker. Based on the ending of the last movie, I think we do. Mm -hmm. That was that last thing. He popped open the locker door and they all looked down. Yep. And I flash back to the orgy ritual that he had triggered. So, yeah. Oh, worms. Okay. Yes, the worms. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So. But... Have you yeah. ever retrieved the future? Life? Nope. I have no. not. Okay. Because if I retrieve a future life, am I changing it? Because of our linear view okay. of future. Good point. It's just like when I read, I remind people I'm not a fortune teller. Here are your options. Here's the tough stuff, how to get around it. Here are the opportunities to grab, but here's your toolbox. Past lives are great, but free will is where we make our differences. So you're, it, that implies the way you said it, that you could retrieve a future life, but you refuse to because of the damage it might do. That may be how my higher self feels about it. You know? <laughs> uh, look, and and I other no side higher selves may be okay with it. <laughs> I have no freaking idea why I do what I do. But we're not. I have selves. never been trained in any of this stuff. It's like all of a sudden mm -hmm. the universe handed me my draft notice and said, fine, now you can see past <laughs> lives and talk to dead people and do hands-on healing. You're drafted. <laughs> Yeah, I, I often wonder, you know, if, if my soul's plan is that I'm on vacation because I've had such a mm. great life and uh, I have the frequent experience that people behave better around me. And <laughs> so uh, we sometimes get R in our lives. Yes. And so, but, you know, whereas somebody else said, oh, my God, you've had such a tragic life. It's like, what? So, well, your husband died, you, you, you had a stillbirth, your house burned down. It's like, that happens to everybody. <laughs> I had yeah. true love, capital T, capital L. It, I, I've had a fantastic life. Or, while you may think it's an R in our life, the fact that you have had such resilience from Alphine's death, the stillbirth, the house burning down, you are demonstrating to others how to live that examined life. You're someone that mm. goes next. And, you know, I can't stand people that come up to me 15 years ago, they had stomach cancer. They go, hi, I'm Mary Sue and I'm a cancer survivor. Look, um, in 1973, I was the Brady Crocker homemaker of tomorrow for New Jersey in high school. Uh, yeah, I was, but I don't tell people that now. Um, so. For your life, I would say you may have come in to demonstrate to others that you can get past it. I've done the cancer dance three times. I went from that Dolly Parton figure that you first met in 1974 to a fat fire plug with permanent side effects because of the double mastectomies and the three cancers. But... Mm. I am a better teacher. I am kinder. So if I had to go through all of that to be who I am at peak now, I did. I am someone that can help people stop looking at it as, oh, it's so horrible. Yeah, we'd rather it didn't happen, but learn to do the cancer dance. Find out how graceful you can be under pressure. Avoid getting your toes stepped on and get off the dance floor in one piece if you possibly can. <laughs> If I did not have that cancer three times, I might not have had that message. And I know I have affected hundreds of women, giving them strength and courage and a new way to look at it. So you may have done the same thing for others 
going through what challenges you did. I don't know about me, but my husband, well, he was, uh, you know, doing the cancer dance, which we called it too. So, uh, at toward the end, he said, I would, I, it was entirely worth it to do, do this. If we have convinced the, uh, at one point he was hallucinating. They mm-hmm. first thought he had uh, ICU psychosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I smelled, they were putting vitamins in his feeding tube. And I said, oh, the psychosis, the hallucinations he's having go away when, whenever he, he gets his vitamins in his feeding tube. Cause he kept doing, doing this because he would, what he was doing is he was taking things out of his hands. He'd have a tactile Mm-hmm. He could tell you this is 14 gauge wire. Now this is a, a 12 gauge piece, a triangular piece of metal. This is a, and he just they kept appearing in his hands, and he'd take them out. And whenever he got the vitamins, it wouldn't go away. And we, I said, wait a minute, and I looked up the vitamins that are used up by many of the drugs he was taking. Mm-hmm. And found out that he, what, is, what he probably had was pellagra, uh, medically induced pellagra, because it was burning through all of the B, um, I forget which B B is. And the social worker said, oh, I have so many of the patients in the old age homes who are doing that too. And I said, well, why don't you suggest that maybe they get double doses of vitamins and he said if i have gone through this and it means that old age homes start upping the vitamins of all of these old people who are having to deal with this shit it will be totally worth it because uh, his um his pt and his ot his uh, physical therapist and occupational therapist wrote him up after our doctor gave him a prescription to cover the vitamins that he was uh th- that were just enough vitamins to balance out what the vit- what the drugs was he was taking mm-hmm. uh and at that point he suddenly leapt forward in his uh in his recovery from the uh, Guillain-Barre mm-hmm. and uh, they it was just an amazing thing he, twice as twice as fast as normal because yeah guess what we need nutrients and then often uh but he was like yeah if 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 i can have that effect i'm i'm happy to have done it mm-hmm. so um i don't know about me but i do know about him and um i don't think we convince the head of the uh rehab department who very much didn't believe in nutrition mm-hmm. <laughs> but we certainly got to the ot and the pt and it, if the social worker brought that over to the old folks homes where she worked, wouldn't that be a nice thing to do? Mm-hmm. Um, I keep one of the things I say is when you wake up dead and you look back on your life, what have you done? And one of the best lives I remember encountering was a woman who uh, worked to get temperament put into the kennel clubs breeding things that was right after when they had dick and jane and they were selling cocker spaniels like crazy and then the cocker spaniels all went bananas Mm -hmm. and so she spent 30 years of her life trying to get temperament into the things it was like waking up after at the end of your life and saying i did that that's a worthy life (laughs) Anyway, that sorry, I, That's excuse okay. me, that pesky soapbox got under my feet again. That's okay. <laughs> so, any other questions at this point? Yeah, because we are getting close. Okay, what are you up to these days? What am I up to? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, um, I'm starting to work on uh, the next book. 
with Pat Dumas, who is the most amazing, freaking awesome astrologer I have ever known. Really? Uh, she's down in, yes, she's down in York, Pennsylvania. And uh, all I can tell you is this is a woman that um, she didn't predict, but when it was obvious in those last week or two that Queen Elizabeth was on her last legs, she picked the day and practically the hour that we would hear mm. that the queen had gone. Mm. She just, what she does is amazing. Um, so anyway, she and I are working on a book. Um, I'm teaching in Patreon, which is great fun. That's that's why Catherine is one of my nestlings. Um, I'm still doing uh, Psychic what are you Cares and Expo. On what are you teaching on Patreon? What am I not teaching? Um, <laughs> With me personally, it's you got a link tarot. we can put up so people can go look. Um, tarot and oracle cards and past lives and teaching them to read. I bring in teachers. Uh, Pat Dumas was one of them. My friend uh, Tiffany Butler, who is a kick-ass shaman. Um, I have Dax Carlisle from the Tarot Guild coming in to talk about tarot and numerology. I've got Rachel Ginther of Garden of One coming to talk about vibrational essence. Um, I had Cindy Howell, who does uh, magnificent crystal jewelry, come in and talk about crystals and what and how and why. It's not just me saying, see, I know everything, but <laughs> it is a place where people can come. I have some people that are just about at my level and some bloody rookies, but everybody is welcome. It's only about, I think I have 16 people max. Um, and I keep it very inexpensive. But this is not one of those Patreons that has a tier of like hundred dollars. It's, it's ten bucks, ten bucks a month. Come and learn with us. That's that's what it is. Um, give me thirty two and a half seconds, and I will see if yeah. I can. And, find and of course, it. sometimes you go out and shovel. <laughs> no, I don't. That <laughs> is what Carl does. We have a um, wonderful tractor. Ah. It's a Kubota. And because of uh, its grill and what its uh, little headlights look like, its name is Stitch. Because <laughs> it looks like Experiment 626. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Oh, good. And there is the thing. If you need to, uh, you it, there's three dots at the end of the chat. And if you click on those three dots, then you get to save the chat to your computer. And then you can find all the links that have been put in here so far. Yep. And, 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 and that's smart really like remarks from the background. <laughs> well, so. this, I hope it was useful. I hope you've inspired people because you usually do. I hope I didn't talk too much because I usually do. <laughs> well, I thought it was absolutely wonderful mm -hmm. because past lives is one of those topics in the rack, like all the other topics, Mark study this more and to have mm -hmm. somebody who works with it who can give practical grounded advice yes that's it this stuff give me something i can use and it takes talent and experience to get to where you can do that and you can do that i um, look uh griffin i have always been someone that leaves the wiki woo jargon on the shelf be, I tell stories with allegory and I repeat over and over again, you can do what I do because, you know, I'm 68. Mm -hmm. In 30 years, I'm dead. And there are 8 billion people in the world and I can't read them all. We need to bring up the next generation like Catherine. So that's what I do. So we will I'd like to thank her. Catherine for coming and sharing her experience as well. That, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you, darling. And on mute. Sorry. <laughs> You're welcome. Always here to support. And yes, I, I can vouch. I'm a nestling. And it's it's just a great community to be with like-minded individuals. Oh, it yeah. Be oh. touches on so many subjects. So don't mm -hmm. ever feel like, oh God, I, I can't do this. I can't read mm -hmm. people's tum mm -hmm. and see for yourself. Well, I just <laughs> love to be in the company who actually believe that this is real and work with it every day. Yeah. You okay, know, I'm, this... I'm just going to get do a what, what's coming up next. Uh, mm -hmm. Next week, we've got John Beckett 
uh, talking about why the uh, why your tarot reading isn't always fortune telling. Why why it might uh, you know what what might cause it not to be an accurate reading of the future, but it's mm. still useful. Um, the week after that is more a discussion. We're going to talk about who's lived in a ha- haunted house and what was it like. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, then on the first week, the first Wednesday in April, we got Chris Croucher. We're going to actually do the luck circle because a lot of people oh, okay, good. weren't up for that oh, nice. when, when we tried it first. Uh, in the 19th, we're going to be talking to Deirdre Arthen about building community. She She's uh, one of the bright lights of the uh, Earth Spirit community. Uh, seems like Rachel Pollock is uh, uh on she her way out transitioning and she we has died just, we might just yes. do a uh she just uh, passed uh she did yeah. yeah yes the uh i was thinking we might do a a let's talk about rachel and other uh of our the tarot people and what they've taught us huh. anyway so that's that's the stuff that is coming that we have ta- coming up but i'm going to say oh uh lois I just wanted to remind people that any of the links that are posted in the chat will be in the description box below the YouTube video. Mm. We we all love so magical because she does the computery things that right. That mm-hmm. I'm just bless you. I have a little block in my mind. I'm going to try and get through it, but baby steps. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, but tonight, we just again say thank you to Corby, thank you to Lois, and thank you to all for coming. And re- tell your friends about the Changing Times, Changing Worlds Conference and community and uh, mm-hmm. other worldly show Wednesdays. And it's on, and recordings go over on the YouTube channel. So uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Corby. It's good to be here.